Oftentimes, when you think about health disparities, the problem seems way too big to fix. And I think coming in as a medical student, that was my biggest challenge. I needed to focus on what were some actionable changes that I could make that would impact my immediate community at my medical school in the city that I live in. At my school, a lot of people are very interested in advocacy work, but medical students don't really have the avenue to get started in that. Partially because of time constraints for medical students, one thing that I recently got involved in is a social justice program that is aimed at increasing awareness about social justice causes, as well as connecting medical students with mentors who are significantly involved in advocacy work. We decided that we wanted to use media to disseminate information about the people who do it and how you can get connected to them. During my preclinical years, I've volunteered as a UM Cure Scholar. So the Cure Scholars program is a program that matches up medical students with elementary school students here in Baltimore City to be engaged in a rigorous program to improve the students' performance in STEM fields. My involvement in that program really opened my eyes to the barriers that young people face when they grow up in an environment where they're not empowered. I'm one of the co-presidents of our LGBTQ health student organization. In that organization, we put together talks where we have people who are on the front lines of addressing the healthcare needs of the LGBT community. We have them come and speak to our student population and share their stories of how they address health disparities. A lot of the students have come to the university maybe never having been exposed to having a conversation that involves a lot of those personal details. It requires a level of skill to be able to comfortably have that conversation with someone and frame it in a way that the patient understands that their health needs are being understood and prioritized by their provider. So students can come out of that course feeling better prepared to dialogue with their patients and address the health needs that their patients present them with. The work can be taxing, but the progress that you see when you institute changes that are effective, really keep your advocacy work going. Hopefully those things will lead to greater involvement in addressing health disparities through changes in educational policy at the medical school level, as well as increasing the representation of underrepresented minorities in medicine. Imagine that paying a visit to your doctor is as intuitive as going to your favorite restaurant and ordering your favorite meal. Without even looking at the menu, most of you could probably order something that you really like, right? In the case of healthcare, how about going to the doctor and following a healthcare agenda that you yourself have established? That's kind of the way I see e-patients. They are empowered, equipped, and enabled patients who are intimately knowledgeable about their own healthcare agenda. As a result, they're more compliant and informed, and they often have better health outcomes as a result of that. At the crux of the e-patient model is shared decision-making. Shared decision-making is where patients and providers collaborate to establish healthcare goals and to choose treatment plans. Shared decision-making, unfortunately, is often not an option for patients who face barriers to health care, particularly the social determinants of health, such as race, socioeconomics, or education, and other social identities. Here's an example. Last summer, while I was volunteering uh, at an outpatient clinic in my current and home city of Baltimore, I met Tom. Tom was a 19-year-old gay man uh, who was also homeless. 
he had、um, come in because he had started seeing a new partner, and he wanted STI testing, and he also wanted to establish care. He said that while he was certainly interested in being healthy, he faced barriers to healthcare, particularly that it was hard to find an LGBT-friendly provider, and also that his homelessness had made it difficult for him to access a doctor, and it also made it expensive to see the doctor. Here we can see that Tom's access to the healthcare environment was impeded by his compounding identities, particularly his sexual minority status. And his homelessness. Tom never followed up to that appointment, and this and this outcome of not following up is unfortunately too common among patients who、um, face these multiple barriers to care. Tom's story illustrates the concept of the intersectional patient, the patient whose social identities have communicating and multiplicative effects on. Healthcare access for the intersectional patient, the social determinants of health, such as race, gender, or education, often work cooperatively to limit engagement in healthcare. The question then is for the provider: How do we turn these intersectional patients into e-patients? The intersectional challenges posed by these patients should be met with interdisciplinary strategies. Let me remind you that shared decision making is what we want to make the standard of care and accessible to everyone. And in order to do so, we can pursue three major strategies: we can increase health literacy, we can maximize continuity of care, and we can reduce the barriers to care. I'll start with health literacy. We want to empower the patient to make the most informed healthcare goals possible as they work with their provider, and to do so, providers such as medical students, residents, and physicians can advocate for collaboration between their healthcare institution and healthcare education programs to develop content that is educationally appropriate for the population being served, because low educational attainment should not be a barrier to health literacy. Moving on to continuous care, we often find that transportation is one of the biggest reasons that patients are lost to follow-up, especially patients who are of low socioeconomic background. Here, again, providers can advocate for their healthcare institutions to collaborate with local、uh, governments to bolster transportation. Uh, and transportation services and augment continuous care in that capacity for their population that's being served. Continuity of care is one of the most salient predictors of improved health outcomes. And lastly, we want to minimize the barriers to care, starting from the provider end. An example of this is cultural competency. Educating medical students and physicians to be culturally competent. When engaging with marginalized and underserved communities, will help remediate those disparities faced by the communities. In effect, we, in effect, we will increase the retention of the patients who need the most help. So, intersectional patients often、uh, require、um, specialized and more personalized care. And in this case, they require interdisciplinary care. Therefore, the future role of the provider is to advocate and deliver interdisciplinary solutions. On a parting note for diversity itself, I would like to highlight that each and every patient is a beautifully complex amalgamation of lived experience, choices, emotions, and thoughts. The intersectional quality of patients are not just challenges or barriers to be overcome, but they are truly assets that testify to the fortitude of the human spirit. Thank you.